You're late. A viewer is never late, Frodo Baggins. He clicks play precisely when he means to. <laughs> Hello again and welcome to another episode of Harebrained Games. We're going to do a game review today on a game called Hunt for the Ring. This is a game for two to five players. And it involves the initial portion of the journey of Frodo Baggins. Basically from the time he stops laughing in, uh, in the Shire till the time he reaches Rivendell, where he's put into a medical nightgown and asked to say hello to 50 of his closest friends one by one. At least that's how the movie portrays it. In this game, it is a hidden, hidden movement game where one player takes Frodo and uh, attempts to get A in part one, get uh, to Bree or a near, near Bree uh, without being corrupted by the Nazgul. In part two, he sets off on a second portion of the journey from Bree over to Rivendell, and things get a little more accelerated at that point. Is this game any good? Let's find out. All right, so we're about to embark on part one of the hunt for the ring. Now, this is a little bit peculiar because, as you know, playing both sides in a hidden information game, usually Frodo's side will be over here and the Nazgul's side will be elsewhere such that they cannot see the hidden movement board. But in this case, because I'm explaining the gameplay, we're just going to have to live with it. So how the game is set up, Frodo's on the movement track here. You will not see him on the board. He makes his way down. He has 16 moves to be able to get from wherever he starts on one of these blue locations over to one of the exit locations, which is at the end here, A, B, or C. Oh, corruption track at zero. He's not corrupted yet. All right, and these are the four Nazgul, and they are placed in positions, uh, four players, three players, two players. They're always in play. It's just a matter of some of them are controlled by more than one master uh, player. We have the helper cards, and we're going to put him out of the way, which are the start cards for... For my good friend Frodo, Frodo, Samwise, and Peregrine, and they have special abilities that are active through the game. You can flip them, and which removes them completely from the game for the rest of the game, so it's a sobering choice to make in order to do, usually, to, um, to, uh, do something like very a large scale change like don't take corruption when you're supposed to or take an extra movement and try and slip past or whatever these are the uh, ally cards which um, Frodo starts with I believe three at the start I'm just gonna lay those out there here we have the master controller for Frodo and these are uh, for example, I've already randomly picked from these to decide that Frodo starts at location 3. Only I know this. This is the area where I'll be using my pen to be able to mark down his location over time. These are fellowship tokens that you will accrue through various methods during the game. When accrued, they go out of the pool onto Frodo's card, and then he can use them in order to activate some of these events. For example, some of these are like spend a fellowship token to to cancel the effects of a perception, action, etc. And that's really all for Frodo. He's ready to go. Uh, he's got the nice map to be able to look at so his eyes scanning on the board doesn't give away the location to those nasty Nazgul. As for the Nazgul, well they start with one sorcery card per player, not per Nazgul, per player, and that's available to them. They have the handy turn reference sheet, uh, order of play. I'm just going to use these tokens right now as order of play so I know which to move in which order. Um, they also have extra some some of these. These are tracking tokens to play so they can try and sort of triangulate where, where that little dude is. And these are for uh, adding later. These are the corruption tokens. Those. So if they take... Ooh, one corruption token, one eye token. Eye tokens accumulate, so the more eye tokens you get, the more damage they do when you draw another eye token. And of course, we have the the dice, the master dice of Nazgul nastiness. 
And with that, we're ready to roll, so let's go ahead and do a sample turn and show you what we're looking at. One other thing I should mention are these tokens here. Now, you draw five of a pool of of several of these at the start of the game. There's only four that you start with. I'm playing the mode that says there's only four you start with, but these are special locations where the Nazgul are going to look for information. They don't know what these are, but if they search or try to hunt in any of these locations, no matter what happens, whether they find Frodo or not, um, if they do it in any of these directions, they get this token. And what can they do with this token? Well, they can bring it over and put it here on the special Black Rider map. And the more tokens they accrue, the more options they have available to them during the dice roll. <clears throat> we start off by automatically giving them this one, which is a move one, which means that not only can a player, a Nazgul player on their turn, use a dice for its intended purpose, but they can also use one of the dice uh, instead, alternately, to be able to move an extra space and eke out a little more motion towards the Frodo-ness. So that's what those are for. So, order of business number one. Uh, Frodo starts first, the ring bearer gets a turn. Now, during day, this is day, day, night. Day, day, night. So it's the same thing, like you're going to take two day turns and a night turn. We're going to start off with our day turn, and we can do one of three things. Uh, actually, we can do all three things in any order once during our turn. We can move, and we have to during the day. Always have to move during the day. And we can spend a fellowship token, which we don't have one right now. And... We can play one of these cards during our turn. Now, one thing we didn't do is roll the dice, and we're going to do that now. All right, so let's see. Um, oh, that's not good for Frodo. So these are the options, old dice, that, that the Nazgul can use to do actions. One of the things that's missing is if I had rolled, and we're going to keep this on the ring side, if I had rolled this Special side, then Frodo gets a fellowship token for every one of these. These are wild cards to the Nazgul, where they get to use it for basically effectively anything they want to do. And so they give a bonus to, to Frodo as well. In this case, that didn't happen, so we're left with these six dice to contend with. So Frodo starts off without any fellowship tokens. So he's going to make a choice. He's at three. Okay, he's at three. Now what's he going to do? What's he going to do? It really is not... That big of a choice because all he can do at this point is go move a direction. He can move here, here, or here in his one move. And how does they handle the dots? Well, by putting a dot. There you go. Now we know that Frodo is in location three, but he's also somewhere out around it on the outskirts. He's still technically here as his last location, which is an important um, aspect of the game is to know Frodo's last known location. Because the Nazgul will find, if they find this location, they found Frodo no matter how many dots he's put to try and, and get around. Now, theoretically, I could use, right off the bat, um, one of these... Frodo Baggins move to move again, but I don't want to do that right now. Um, that's not a good idea. So anyway, that's that's basically his turn. He doesn't have a fellowship token. Oh wait, no. At the start of each day, take one fellowship token if you have fewer than two. Uh huh. All right. Aren't we supercharged and powerful? So then we look and go. Are there any cards that I can take that will make make me interesting? Um. You know, I'm going to place, do this, I'm going to place one ally token in bag end or took bank, so either location 1 or 15, I'm going to do 15, and that ally location is now in their place, yep, then move any ally tokens in play. All right. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to do that. Why are we doing that? Because those ally tokens are kind of like blockers. They slow down the Nazgul and try to make it harder for them to find Frodo directly. And that's the end of turn one for the Ring Bearer. Now we're going to go do the Ring Wraith's turn. All right, it's time for the Nazgul. Now the Nazgul have their own abilities, although they tend to generally need to work together. Uh, because they have a physical presence on the map, you will be able to kind of see how they're approaching the whole area. My guess is that most people would want to canvas starting off initially as much as possible with uh, 
with trying to just kind of like spread out and look. Now on their turn, and we'll go through the orders follow. So we've got red and green and blue and purple. So we'll start with red. Now on your turn, white uh, on the daytime, Nazgul get to move one space. So I'm going to move to this dot here. Isn't that exciting? Um, then they can do an action, or they can do an action and do that, but they get to choose from one of these what they can do. Now you'll notice that the options match up. So there's there's a searching, there's perception, and then there's hunting, and then there's drawing and playing a card. Now this, I could use this card right now, but I'm not going to yet because I don't think it's really as valuable yet. I could also use this dice to draw one. Uh, right now, I am... I am going to go ahead and not do anything with him because I know that Frodo's not there. He started out somewhere here. So right now, oh, and I did my movement. Got to move up. Got to show people he's moved one space. Um, right now, I'm just going to leave that be uh, because these dice have to last through an entire series of day, day, and night. And so I do want to be careful when I want to use them. Then... I'm going to go ahead and go to next, which is green. Green green is going to go, he's going to canvas this. He's going to go here. And that's what he's going to do. Why, you ask? Well, because if Frodo was up, in the, up here and starting off here, then I want to try and get up there and see if I can figure out where he is. Now I'm going to do something different here. I know that I'm not going to be having too much in the way of perception, um, Choices, so I'm going to go ahead and use up that dice to take advantage of this to move one additional step right here. So he's going to move here instead. So he's made some better progress. Then we have blue. Blue is just going to straight up go this way, and I'm going to actually have him use this dice because we're not we're not going to be close to Frodo anytime soon to draw another sorcery card. Perform a perfection a perception inside the area containing the active Nazgul. Then perform a second perception containing a different one. Well, that's going to be really valuable later. I'll explain why. Finally, we have purple. Now, purple is on the main road, which means purple, if they start and stop on the main road, they don't go off the beaten path, can make one, two, three moves. Powerful Nazgul. Of their turn. Uh, and so we're done with that first phase. Now we're going to go... And look and say, okay, advance the turn marker. There is no encounter that the Nazgul will have with Frodo yet. So then we're going to do our second move. And this time it goes down to Frodo. Frodo. Frodo the door. All right. So we're looking here. Normally I wouldn't look over here. I'd look on my map, but just to give a little better picture. So we are somewhere here, here, or here at this point. We could go back to three. We could not, but... I could go here, which seems like that would be the fastest route, or I could pop over here where my ally is on 16 and see if I could thread the needle between them. You know what? I'm going to go here. So I've gone 3.40. So I'm going to... 40. So I'm going to... Can I... S Numbers are hard. All right. So now... Frodo is in a new location. He's at 40. We're going to bump this up to 2. And that's it. And then we're going to decide. Now, he does have less than 2. So, at the start of the turn, I can add one of these. And then, do I want to use them? Okay. Choose a location. 12 or 8. I'm not going to do that yet. I don't see a need. So, I'm going to go ahead and use one of my tokens to draw a card. Ooh. Wow, you may move any ally tokens in place. I could play that right now, but I don't feel the need. I'm going to leave that there where it is. And that is the end of Frodo's move for now. Now we're back to the Nazgul, reporting live. All right, so now we're at I'm going to put these dice here so we can get a little better visual. I'm at red, red's movement. Red is also on the path, so I'm going to do one, two, three movement with him. And I don't think it's possible for Frodo to be anywhere where I can search yet, so we're going to let that go. We're going to go to green. Actually, no, we're going to use up a dice. 
and have him go one space farther. Then we're going to have green go, and green is going to do one. He's going to give up a dice. Eh, get back here. And he also is going to go one farther. We're going to try and get, as soon as we can, get over there. Finally, we have blue, and blue we're going to move here, but we're not going to use a dice just yet. And then finally, we have purple, and purple is going to do one, two, three. He's going to keep on the beaten road. So that's as far as they're going to get. They're not going to use anything yet, because there's still a night phase to go. So that's going to be it for their turn. Now we're back to Frodo. And it's nighttime. Now here's the interesting choice of nighttime. If you don't want Frodo to move, then yay, all is well. Frodo's going to rest. And in fact, Samwise lets him heal a corruption as long as Samwise is around when he rests. However, that is... Not relevant here, because he has zero corruption right now. He has zero corruption over there. But had he chosen to move, that would be bad. He would take a corruption, and hunts would be free. So a hunt is like the, the, the most powerful form of searching for Frodo. I, search is the bad term, but it's the most powerful form of identifying Frodo. A hunt is where if you find Frodo, you can attack Frodo. So that's where you have to be a little careful at night. Also, at night, uh, the these guys get extra movement, and so they can move two spaces instead of one. Uh, so we're going to start off and have red go first. Uh, he could do his normal move. I'm going to actually do one, two, and then I'm going to have him do a search. A search, there are three, three types of, of, of triangulating or locating Frodo. Each one is a little bit more powerful in, in general. Um, search is kind of a blind blanket. Hey, has Frodo ever been here? And that's all you can ask. Has Frodo ever been here? Doesn't matter if he's still there. It all that matters is on this trail that he's doing. Has he ever been there? And, it, and the answer is either yes or no. And with that, the Nazgul have information they didn't otherwise have. There's perception. Now, perception is a little better than just hey, has he ever been here? It's is he somewhere in this region? And how that works is a perception. And you can only do that with a die. Searches, searches don't require a die. They're a free action, which means they don't cost a die to use. But a perception will let you say, hey, are you in, in one, two, three, section one, two, three? And that can be a yes or no. Or are you in section A, B, C, or D? You can't ask both. You can only ask one. So the, the hobbit has to answer truthfully. For example, right here, I'm going to do a perception. And I'm going to say... And, and it has to be in the area where the Nazgul is. So you can't just go ask all over the board. The Nazgul has to be either in the place that's being searched or hunted, or they have to be in the area where they're going to be asking about. And so I would ask, hey, is Frodo in... Um, let's do section B. Is Frodo in area B? And you'd look and go, nope. He is not. Now, interestingly enough, had he asked, is Frodo in... In sector two, the answer, because these sector marks show it, would be yes, because he's down here. And that would give the Nazgul an information to know that somewhere from here all the way down to here, somewhere Frodo's here. So it removes these sections of the board and helps locate a little better. In this case, I would have chosen poorly, not knowing it, and saying, is he in B? No. Well, then we know that, okay, we what we do know that he's not going to be here. He didn't, yeah, but he could be here. He could be here, get in all kinds of places he could be. Um, and that's how perception works. Lastly, we're going to have, so we had red move. We had green is just going to move two to try and be up here. Then we're going to have blue move. Blue is going to move one, two. And finally, purple is going to move, actually he's going to stay, yeah. He's going to stay there because we have one die left, which is the hunt die, which is the most powerful die. And so we're going to say, you know what, we're going to have him hunt just as, you know, it's a dumb move, but we're going to show it. So when he hunts, he says, is Frodo, has Frodo ever been here? Is this on his search trail? And the hobbit then has, if it's a hunt rather than a search, the answer has to be either yes, 
that he that he has been there before and if he's there he has to go and yes Frodo is here so this is the way to absolutely pinpoint the exact location of Frodo it's the only way and so in this case the answer would be no Frodo's at 40 and he's here and that would be the end of the Nazgul turn in the nighttime. Now, at that point, then we reset it. Um, the ring bearer gets a free, free card. That's always good. Uh, the, um, if there were multiple players for the Nazgul, they would go ahead and, and swap out who gets to be the lead next. So then it would be, you know, whatever, changing over there. Um, we'd re-roll the action die. And so we'd have some more sorcerers who could get more cards, a couple hunts. So that looks interesting. And then, of course, Frodo, if there were any, any wild cards or wild dice there, then Frodo would get a fellowship token for each one. And then finally, yeah, and finally we're ready to roll. So we've gone through pretty much a full day-day-night cycle. Now I'm going to go ahead and show you an example of what Frodo would be doing in the case of a successful hunt. Okay, so if you look at our chart, you'll see that I have simulated Frodo getting all the way up to 56 ah, here, okay? So let's assume that I came here, or I was there, I used a hunt die, and I said, hey, is Frodo here? Yes, he's here. At the end of everybody's Nazgul turn, so um, right now those two would be out of it, but if somehow, some way, I could get here, uh, we would be able, this, the adjacency would help out with, um, with the attack on Frodo. At the end of every Nazgul turn, at the end of that whole section, when all four of them have moved, then if Frodo's here, you would be able to say, okay, I have two Nazgul, one on top and one in vicinity. I'm going to draw two of these tokens. Ooh, that's three corruption. Three corruption. Now, Frodo has some opportunities to flip and remove some of his friends from play. And I mean, they're gone. They ain't coming back in order to be able to remove a hunt tile. So I could, for example, flip over Samwise, put this back in the pool, and only take one corruption right there. And that's how that works. At the end of it, Frodo escapes to the next location. Now, he has an ability to go as many dots as he's already got. So, for example, if I was somewhere, if I was, say, a dot away, I would have two dots plus as many dots as I wanted to try to escape. So, for example, he might want to go one, two, three, one, two. Uh, he'd want to get out of there, and he'd want to trick them in some way if he could. This would be a perfect one. If he had two dots plus he had his third dot, so he could basically move over and move to 60. So he would move to 60, and of course that would bump this up, make him farther, and that would be the end of that. He would escape, per se. The whole point of Frodo is to get all the way to one of these places. Once he reaches here, then this phase, part one of the game, is over, and whatever corruption he's accrued is going to carry over with him to part two. The Nazgul will obviously be hunting him down and chasing him down and trying to do anything they can to corrupt him as much as they can before, to either stop him from getting there before he gets to 12 corruption and loses the game, or if he gets there but they want to get him there with a lot of corruption on him so that in part two he starts at a disadvantage. And that's basically the, the, the gist of part one. There's a lot of nuances from the card play that come into play. We didn't really touch on any of these. Um... But you get the gist that these are special bonuses that you can do with the dice. Uh, but that's how, how the ebb and flow of the game happens. If you get to 16 and Frodo isn't there yet, if he's somewhere nearby but he hasn't got there, then for every step it takes to get to a safe place, he has to draw a corruption token and handle that. So it really is in the best interest to try to sneak on through and get to uh, the safe locations as fast as possible. And with that, let's get to my final thoughts on this game. Aha! You thought I was just going to go do part one and go to my final thoughts, didn't you? Haha! -ha. No, I don't play, I don't eat half a steak, I don't play half a basketball game, and I don't review half of a board game. So we are going to go over part two, which covers the next step in the journey, which is kind of an exciting change. There are some differences that occur. Once part one is done... You take certain elements of it, you take the corruption level and <clears throat> the cards in play, etc. Well, not all, 
not all the cards in play, but, and you basically flip the board. So now you'll see this is a slightly different board than we had before. We add Strider. That's what some folks call him. Right here as an extra bonus, and we add Mariatic Brandy Buck if he's around. He might be coming in early during uh, part one, but if he doesn't, then he comes in now for certain. And we have now we have a new sheet that shows us Gandalf, what Gandalf can do because he can do some interesting things that otherwise uh, you wouldn't get to do in step one because gosh, Gandalf was missing on the right debris. And that, you see the board has changed. We have a different type of board here. You'll notice there's a lot more starting spots than there were. Uh, a little more spacious, not as many steps as there were, not as concentrated, because we're going, now we're going from Bray over to Rivendell, which is our target. We need to get to Rivendell or one of these exit spaces. This is the point where if, if Frodo can get here to one of these spaces without incruing uh, too much corruption, he will win the game. So this is where the Nazgul really have to step up their game, so to speak. And as for the Nazgul, you'll notice now that they also retain their their, source, their uh, cards that they can use, sorcery cards. They have the standard stuff as they did before. Do they get any bonuses to combat Gandalf's awesomeness? Yes, they get the Lord of the Nazgul. The Lord of the Nazgul? It's pretty cool. <clears throat> He gets to uh, he gets to add, and he comes into play through a card power. And when he does, he replaces whoever whoever brought him into play. And so instead of being a Nazgul, he gets Lord of the Nazgul. And he gets there's an extra dice that rolls with extra abilities on the on the sides of the dice that kind of supercharge some of the actions you can take and help thwart Gandalf. He is rather temporal. If he goes in, if he does manage to find Frodo directly, then he's worth two corruption tokens instead of one. But he is removed from play. So he's in there, he does some damage, he messes around, and then he and then he leaves, and you're back to just the standard run-of-the-mill Costco Nazgul. And with that, we will get started. Also, notice that coming over, whatever we earned in the first phase for extra bonuses applies here. Uh, so if we'd earned any of these extra information things, then those abilities would still be relevant here as well in, in part two. Now what's different is a Gandalf has Gandalf tokens instead of the information tokens. And what that means is Gandalf, Gandalf is on the board. Frodo is on the board. They're both on the board. Now, unlike step one, part one, you're actually taking care of, of Gandalf. He's the one you're moving. You are directly manipulating him. And so you have no control over Frodo anymore. What? Well, here's why. Because Strider's taken over, and Strider is going to take one of these cards... And these are the actual pre-programmed path that Frodo will take. And he will take these from like step 1 to 14. There are versions of this that allow, that make him go 16 steps and allow him to incur more corruption. Or there's this, this section or this type of card that lets him go 14 spaces or only takes 14 spaces to get there. But if he gets 12 corruption, he's doomed. Doomed, I say. And so you'll notice that he starts off at 4. So, and we don't even need to track it here anymore because we know, based on every time he moves, we know where these guys have gone from 1 to 14. So he starts at 4, and then from 4 he's going to go out in the wild, he's going to go to 11, and then he's going to go to, wow, 21. He's going to take a pretty direct route. Um, and these are shuffled and they're different, so you're not going to ever know, the Nazgul will not know um, which, which path he's going to take. They're going to have to ascertain that themselves. Gandalf, on the other hand, has these tokens, and there are eight or nine of them around, and you shuffle and grab four. And that is cool, because you pick one of them and say, I want Gandalf to start there. Gandalf is starting on space 30. Right there. If Gandalf arrives at any of these other spaces, he can reveal himself... And then these get flipped over, and they get put over there, and that allows Frodo to take an additional corruption before he loses the game. So Gandalf has kind of a lot of things to do. Gandalf is running interference here. Instead of being Frodo, you're Gandalf running around, and you're trying to mess in the heads of the Nazgul. And how can he do that? Well, there's certain things that he can do. If you're in a place... Um, if if the Nazgul, if he, he lands in a place where the Nazgul are, he can get rid of a fellowship token, which that means it's gone forever, so you have to be judicious. And then he can move all those Nazguls up to two steps away, he can get rid of an action dice, 
and that's pretty powerful, but you want to use it strategic, like tactically. You want to use it to where it's the best benefit, because you are losing fellowship tokens, which may be used to fuel cards that may also be of interest. So it's it's not something you, you do lightly. He's not a conjurer of cheap tricks. And so that's Gandalf's role. He's going to go around. He's going to try and find Nazgul. Also, what's interesting is that he doesn't have a search path, so it doesn't really matter ever. They're looking for, for the Nazgul are looking for Frodo still. That's their pension. But if he happens to be in an area when they're doing a perception or a, or a, um about where about where Frodo is, he counts. So if he's in an area and, and they're like, hey, is he in this is you know, is something in this area? Well, Gandalf can pretend to be Frodo and kind of throw them off the trail by saying, yes, yes, the, you know, yes, he's here. And then they'll go over there and find out it's just Gandalf and not Frodo. So there's a lot of levels of indirection that Gandalf has as you're playing him to be able to go across and move. The other thing that's interesting is Gandalf doesn't waste time at dots. He's far too powerful for that. He goes from location to location, so when he moves, he doesn't have to do this small-scale movement. He's here, 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 here. He's all over the place. Also, once he reveals himself, and he goes undercover, uh, then you can then you get rid of a token and and or. You, you basically can repos like teleport him places too, and so I'm not going to go through a whole. Um, yeah, maybe I will. Maybe I will go through a, a sample of that so people can see. So we'll go on with that now. Okay, step one, day phase. First thing we do is we move Frodo. We move him here to here. Now we know from this chart that he's at step one, so he is somewhere, well, he's somewhere past four. So he's here or here. Actually, he's here or here. That's where he is. We know that, but they don't know that. Gandalf then makes a choice to move somewhere else. So we're going to have him move... Actually, we're going to have him move to 14 or 16. So we're going to mark that there. He's in spot 16. All right. And the same rules apply. Like, it's... Frodo gets a fellowship token because he has less than two. He has cards he can play if he wants... He's not going to play them now, but he could do that, and that's basically effectively the the um, the end of of that. And now we're going to go to the Nazgul side. I did forget to mention is that the Nazgul don't have to start all the way over there and try and rush over. They're waiting. They're there. They're primed and pumped. Things are getting real, and the timetable is accelerating, so they start here in these two designated spots. And so now they're going to be able to move, and they're going to start doing the same thing they did before in the same order they did before. So, for example, uh, Green is going to move. He wants to move here, and... We didn't, we didn't do the die thing. I didn't really, yeah. So look at that. If I'd been smarter, I would have remembered that these are the things we have. Oh yeah, fellowship token for Frodo, because we drew one of those. So we look and go, mm, no, that's okay. Although we could get sneaky and try and do a search. Actually, no, searches don't work. Gandalf never shows up in searches. He has no search history. He's definitely a, a wizard in incognito mode. So that's about it for that. Then we move blue, and blue is going to move here. And I'm going to accelerate it. We're not going to be hunting anytime soon on that, so move him here. Then we have purple, and purple is going to move down here. And... Hmm. Then we're going to move red and red is just gonna go now we're gonna have a move here there we go and that's it that's the end of the turn around or the round now we go to the next step now what's gonna happen well we know that frodo moves to round two we know he's now at he's now at 11. we know he's here at 11 because that's what our table tells us now it's gandalf's turn and gandalf who is now at 16 16 Oh yeah, there it is, it's 16. So now, I'm going to move Gandalf to 31. I actually, I'm not trying to escape these guys, I'm trying to mess with these guys. Alright, so he's at 31. 
Do we have anything we want to play? Nope. Nope, that's fine. And he has two tokens, he's fine. So we're fine there for now. Alright. Then, we're going to have the Nazgul move again. This time, we're going to go ahead and... And, uh, actually no, we're going to move green, and he's going to move one. So he's here. And... Hmm. He's not there yet. Oh yes, we can. We can do. We can do something. We're gonna search. So we're gonna search and say, has Frodo ever been? No, that's the thing. Since he couldn't have gotten there yet, we need a perception dice, and we're gonna use it. We're gonna use this perception dice, and we're gonna use this and convert it into a perception. And I'm gonna ask, has Frodo ever been, or is Frodo in a? In the A in the A sections. And the answer is no. He has not. So we know where he's not. And so that will help them greatly. Now it's on to blue. Blue is gonna move one space here. Not do anything. Yes he is. He's gonna do that to roll and move to 25. He's gonna use that extra movement, which has become quite valuable. Purple's next. Purple's gonna move here and then do a search. He's gonna say has Frodo been to 31, and the answer is, no, Frodo has not been to 31. Now Gandalf's there, but Gandalf doesn't show up in searches, so there you go, wah ha ha. And then finally, Red is just going to move down here and do nothing. Now we go into the night phase, does Frodo move? He does not, which means that we will have a little extra corruption brought back, which will help us out. And then Gandalf, he's going to decide what he's going to do. And he's going to discard one fellowship token out of the game. Because he's got that special power. He's going to go here to 31. And he's going to say, here I am. <laughs> and he's going to move him two steps away. Mess with him a little bit. It's going to take one of these and throw that out of the game. And there you go. And now nobody can actually do anything in that spot. Gandalf is there. At the end of the round, Gandalf will be disappearing. And when he disappears, there will be a... Um, there he will We will discard and, and figure out where else he goes next so people know. And this goes on and on. <laughs> This, this kind of back and forth goes on and on. I'm not going to finish up, but I want to at least explain what's going on here and how Gandalf changes the game. Um, because as the turns go by, you're going to see that Frodo's going to be making his way across. Gandalf's going to be running interference. He's going to be trying to like manipulate shift. If he has to reveal himself, he will, and that will send people away. Uh, you know, The whole point is to get Frodo here. And if you can get him here before he takes enough corruption, that's great. Gandalf, like I said, can find places and help increase the amount of corruption that Frodo can endure before he turns to the dark side. Um, but that's it. And with that, let's get to my final thoughts on Hunt for the Ring. Haha, -ha, you thought I was going to go right on to my final thoughts without finishing the rest of the game, did you? Did you know there's an extra special provision for those who have War of the Ring? There is. So, basically, this is the culmination of tokens that you can get and use in War of the Ring as a result of this journey. So, you would play Hunt for the Ring, and when Hunt for the Ring was over, depending on your performance and how well you did or did not do, either the Nazgul, the um, enemy forces, will get these two tokens, one or two of these tokens to be able to use during War of the Ring to give you just a little bit of a supercharged bonus if need be. Or if you did well as Frodo, you could get these tokens. And these go directly into a play of War of the Ring. So you could literally play this game two parts, out an hour and a half, two hours, then go into a four or five hour session of War of the Ring with a little edge or whatever. I mean, it's, it's a small and subtle nicety, but it really shows the detail that they put into Hunt for the Ring in, in the way that it can mesh well with their other great products. Now we'll get to my final thoughts. All right, now we're on my final thoughts. We're going to go ahead and get the bad stuff out of the way right now. 
there is a major, major con to this game. I mean, a terrible, terrible dilemma. And I'm just going to get it out of the way right now. This is a very bad single-player solo game. I mean, it's... Let's just get out of the way. It, it is uh, horribly unbalanced playing one player against Frodo. I mean, I don't know who playtested this, but uh, no matter how many times I play it solo... Uh, no matter which strategies I employ, when I switch over to play the Nazgul, they have this uncanny ability to always know where Frodo is. Totally ruins the balance of the game. Uh, yeah, someone didn't really. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I mean, it, it gives me flashbacks to my younger days as an only child when I'm playing hide-and-seek with myself. I mean, no matter where I hide, whatever, I'm constantly thinking, gosh, I, I, I this guy is tough to shake. So... Totally joking. That's not really a con. This is a game for two to five players. So the reality is I don't have any cons to this game. So let's get to the pros. Okay, what do I like about this game besides everything? Uh, the components are top notch. I expect no less from these guys. They've never failed to deliver for me. The, the, the pieces that come with the game are richly artistic. Uh, they're very... They, they, they do everything they're intended to do. They do the job well. There's some cleverness to the, the components um, that we'll get into when I talk about the thing that I really enjoy about this game, which is the details. Um, those little touches that don't always get noticed in, in the, in the large scale of playing through a game. Uh, but the details here elevate this game from just an average game to a top notch experience, uh, a veritable work of art, really. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's clear that considerable thought was made for every detail. Uh, let me give you some examples. Um, the hiding screen. The hiding screen has, you know, the maps here, I mean, it's, uh, other games may have it, but this, it matters deeply, because you don't get metagamed by Nazgul staring at your eyes, staring at a big board, going, huh, he seems to be ain't looking over there. Instead, you're looking at this board, now, you could probably still see if I'm scanning to the left or right, but it is so much more difficult to be able to look at this and go, hey, I'm going here, I'm going there. So you'd really have a really masterful, almost battle station for Frodo here, that's going to keep those guys from getting a little, being obnoxiously, uh, um, aware of your every move. Um, the hiding screen is great. The, the paper slides, I just, I mean, little things like it slides in sideways. So you don't, you slide it in this way, which means there's no jostling. I've had hidden games before where you have to lift a flab, you put it down, it gets jostled, you got to reline it up. Not so with here. I mean, that detail alone is, is, is great. Every place for the tokens, every single place. Like if you want to see a token here, well, look, there's a token. You can find that token. It's visually represented. The tokens here, the tokens represent the, 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 the symbol here represents the tokens where they go, everywhere. It's just the details, the little details that matter here. Um, the Nazgul. I mean, how many times in, in a game, and I've played games that are twice, twice the cost of this, where you're like, uh, okay, which gray guy that I haven't painted yet is the ninja or the rogue? And I'm, I think it's this one. No, maybe that's the, the, the elven dwarf mellow. Uh, no, you don't know. This is, just little things. It's red. Yeah, okay, maybe it doesn't look like a full-featured figurine, but when I'm playing RPGs, I, I do this anyway. I suck at painting. I will literally go and just dab on a little bit of paint just to be able to differentiate between gray figurines. Trying to fail to actually accomplish some sort of like non-sucky painting version of it. So little details like that. All of these actually create a presentation before you even get into the game that actually matter and show just great stuff like persistent storage, the envelope to put everything, clear directions on where to give. The last time I was impressed by the actual packaging and components beyond just the over-the-top things like mechs and minions is Scythe, where your player board has detente, actual cutouts, almost to the degree that it's nearly impossible to not know where everything goes. Those touches and details matter, and Hunt for the Ring, especially since it was like 30 some odd bucks, is way over the top in the quality that you get from the detail that they provide. Um, the other thing I like is the two-phase game. Now, a two-phase game, or any type of game where you're going to go through multiple phases, uh, can go awry in several ways. One, they could be samey, 
where you're basically just revisiting the same thing and doing it repetitiously over and over just to have some extra longevity. Millennium Blades, I think, is one of those ones where it's a great game, but every time you're just basically redoing, you're playing the game three times and it's almost identical, almost identical at the same time. So that you did get the same and you're like, eh. Maybe two rounds was enough. Um, you could also throw a sharp 90 degree into the rules and go, dude, why did we change games halfway through? I don't even recognize what I'm supposed to do anymore. Um, and then there's the issue of does it matter? Does it matter if I actually play step, you know, phase one? Is there, is the, is the actual, um, ramifications of stage one even, even, you know, stark enough that, that it will actually influence stage two in a way that either doesn't make it so that phase two is foregone conclusion or phase two could be played on its own without phase one. I actually think they mesh well together and I think that's hard to pull off and I think they've done a good job of it. It definitely um, sidesteps those issues and contours the play experience just enough that it's um, that you don't feel repetitious at all. I think they did a stellar job on that. Like the movie and the book, you begin with a somewhat meandering journey and you get, you know, little, little, you know, moving steps. And then by part two, it's gotten real. Um, you have a sense of urgency, a sense of tension brewing in part one. And then it boils over in part two, both for the Nazgul and the Fellowship. Uh, the other thing I like is the searching perception hunt thing. Now, some people have gotten caught up on the synonyms on this, but the reality is it's pretty simple. When you start off as a detective, you're searching the background information, you know, you know, like those procedural crime things. It's like, give me details on, on who this person is and who they've known. And that's really what searching is. It's like this like widely spread net that says, have you ever been here before? Have you seen this man? You know... I'm detective blah, Nazgul, Nazgulian and stuff. And then you're like, okay, well, we've got this sort of carpet, like, okay, we get a general idea. Then you have the, the next actions, which cost a bit more, the perception, which is like, okay, can we triangulate his position? You know, check his cell records and all that stuff. And does he actually, you know, okay, oh, looks like we've, we've narrowed it down. And then there's the hunt, which is, okay, dagger time. And you go, here it is. Are you here? You know, where you're like zoned in. He's in the house and he's surrounded kind of thing. I like that. I think that's really clever. And I think they did a really good job of, of making that, that sort of like tightening, tightening rope. And then, and then sometimes Frodo escapes or sometimes you totally didn't get the clues right. Uh, really, really interesting. And finally, the thing that I wanted to, I think that is before we even get to the gameplay, the most that I love is I absolutely have just positive things to say about the manual itself. Now, the manual's been a little maligned recently for its lack of, uh, of uh, brevity, per se. The more I read it and the more I've played this game with people, the more I realized how exceptional uh, it is and how carefully this manual's been composed. Um, basically, in, in, in a perfect world, I want a manual that anticipates my questions as I read. And what do I mean by that? Um, when I read movement rules, the next thing I want is a visual example or some sort of example that explains what rules are if they're more, if they're less simple, you know, more than just move from point A to point B. And this does, because it has different movement rules, it does that for me. Um, it, it covers the whole of it. Another example is I finished part one. I'm going to part two. What do I need to know? What's going to be different? What, uh, what's going to be, what's going to be, um, you know, what components matter now that didn't back then? What new stuff am I adding? Uh, what carries over? What is the new normal for part two as far as rules go? This covers it exactly the way I would want it covered, exactly the way my mind would flow into how I want to know how to do it. It's great. Um, it's presented with perfect sequence. You have a high level view of all the things you can do on one side and the other. And then it goes in and drills down in each section of what those, what those steps detail and what you'll be asked to do. And they does it perfectly, logically, and, and reasonably. Um, it's been called long. It's 39 pages, um, which some people say for a simple game is too much. And it's not exactly all that incredibly simple per se, but I understand where they're coming from. But I think there's a reason why even, even simple games, um, can have a variety of rules adjustments, especially when there are separate rule sets for these parts of the game. Um, it's long because it gives examples everywhere that I want one which is what I want. It's long because wherever it discusses a portion of play, it's like, like information tokens or ally cards. There's a picture. If I want to know what track tokens are, it adds pictures so that I know in line what it is I'm looking at, what pieces I'm going to have to describe this. This is not a bad thing. Um, 
It's long because it's not the same size as the as the box, which means I don't have to open it up like a big Red Robin or Chuck E. Cheese menu, and and, and you know block out the sun so that I don't get to see it. Um, it includes an index, which I've never found to fail. Anytime I've wanted to look something up, I look in the index and I find it. Um, you know, ultimately I want a manual that takes care of me, and this this manual takes care of me. Um, now, the board game enthusiast, I mean, it takes care of me as the board game enthusiast that bought this game and wants to enjoy and get my money's worth and revel in the experience. This manual, frankly, is made for me. Um, it might not be optimal for folks who uh, like to blaze through games right away or that are antsy and excited to get going and they want to just get into the gameplay and all that stuff. Uh, it might not be for people that have a backlog of reviews they are trying to rush through to get done so that they can get to the next thing and they don't want to you know, stop and smell the roses of a great rule book, per se. Um, it's, it's like you play this game like you're going to a fancy steakhouse where there are renowned chefs, and it's all about the experience and the ambiance. You don't walk in there, take a look at a menu, and go, there's too many steaks here. Where's the nearest McDonald's? This is not that type of game. It, it's really, really designed and fleshed out to be a really fun, entertaining, well-presented, well-cared-for experience. And um, for those who are in a hurry, or that like, hey, let's just jump in the game, the reference sheets are fine. Everybody gets a reference sheet to kind of explain, this is what you do, this is what I do. At the end, it really is a simple game in its mechanics, but there are a lot of choices to make with those simple mechanics that you might want to think through and ponder. And I mean, you're, Nazgul have it tough. They've got a tough job, and Frodo has a tough job too. So, And finally, the gameplay. The gameplay is exactly what I'm hoping for in a hidden movement game. I mean, hidden movement games can range all across the board, and many of them I played are simplistic enough that it feels like, like it's just you know battleship with a few special powers. Um, but in this case, there's a subtlety of movement, uh, and and in in contrast to the triangulation methods of determining where Frodo is, uh, the special ally powers, all these things lend to a game experience that transcends just simple, are you here? C5, miss. Hmm, C6, miss. Hmm, B6, hit. Aha! Uh -huh. um, and, and like I said, the first part feels like it's a stealth game where you're, you're, you're applying methods of stealth and indirection to get to the inevitable conclusion of that por portion of the journey. Part two, mixes it up and it feels more like an escort mission um, or uh, a mission, you know, diversion tactics and indirection and, and just kind of escalates that path a little bit. I mean, and honestly, in my opinion, flows perfectly from start to finish. I probably wouldn't wait too long between part one and part two. I don't know that I would do that. I'd probably play part one, go have a sandwich and then finish part two. I mean, why? Why not? It's because um, I would be already in the moment. I'd be I'd be ready and I wouldn't have forgotten a lot of stuff, although you could you could do fine waiting weeks in between and such, but I, I personally would not do that. I'd, I'd wait and go, hey, let's play this, and then let's you know, check something out, and then let's go back and finish up um, if I wasn't going to play it end-to-end, -end, which I most likely probably would. So anyway, there's a, there's a lot of awards kind of that people throw out, you know, seals of excellence and seals of approval and seals of mediocrity and stuff. If I ever did that stuff, I would just call this masterpiece because that's what I think of it. I am so impressed at the price point I got the wonderful game experience that I did. Um, that's what it is. This game, if any game was written for me, it would be this one. And once again, I'm joking about the solo play. Like, you all know that, right? Anyway, Hunt for the Ring, absolutely two thumbs up. A masterpiece that I think everybody should get. I will never get rid of this game, ever. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time on Hairbrain Games.